So the Tennessee Valley Authority was created immediately after Roosevelt took office. The first uh, dams are all 1933 when Roosevelt first came in. They began construction. Wheeler Dam, Chickamauga construction. We didn't have any money. We had nothing to do this with and we did it. Operational, operational, 1936. Beautiful turbine going in to make electricity with. Fontana Dam, during the war, they stepped it up. Operational. Production of ammonium nitrate for fertilizer at TVA. So TVA projects were being studied from uh, people from all over the world sent engineers and politicians, and we sent experts and engineers to, their, to them. And this is Russia, China, Mexico, South America, India. And it started at the very beginning. This is the 19, you see the dates are, of these articles are at the bottom. Um, in 1934, Brazil changed its constitution to reflect what TVA was doing and because they were going to do similar things. Morris L. Cook was the director of the Rural Electrification Administration. He was an expert in applying electricity to lift the population from misery and create a modern workforce. In 1936, Franklin Roosevelt went to Argentina for a Pan American conference. And he, there were mass crowds that were thrilled to see that power was being exerted by a benefactor of humanity. This was noted throughout the world. This shook the world at that time because the United States had reversed the earlier 20th century policy with the good neighbor policy. Roosevelt met in Buenos Aires Jutilio Vargas, uh, the president of Brazil. And Roosevelt refers to him as the second man who created the New Deal. In 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill met on a battleship uh, and they issued jointly what was called the Atlantic Charter. It had been drafted by Sumner Wells, and this is Sumner Wells' typed copy of the original with, uh, of a draft with Franklin Roosevelt's corrections. Uh, Wells was FDR's policy chief at the State Department, not Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State. certain common principles on which they base their hopes for a better future for the world. This was what we were fighting for, and this became the standard for all representatives of Franklin Roosevelt, and it was rejected by all of his opponents, domestic and abroad, that is, the real opponents. But this, this was the rallying point, the Atlantic Charter. They respect the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live, and they wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them, and to bring about uh, improved labor standards, economic advancement, and social security. British Empire leader Winston Churchill doesn't apply to our empire. This, he said this, this is in a speech in London in '42. Let me make this clear in case there should be any mistake about it. I have not become the king's first minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, that society of nations and communities gathered in and around the ancient British monarchy. Wells, Sumner Wells, uh, brought in Lawrence Duggan, 
uh, to run the Latin American desk of the State Department. And Wells and the Duggan family are old family friends of Franklin Roosevelt. This is, on the right uh, is Lawrence Duggan, a very young man. The uh, United States was issuing loans before we got in World War II to South American countries uh, to establish industries, large loans, steel and electric railways for Brazil, hydroelectric projects, In 1942, Franklin Roosevelt uh, brought Morris Cook, the man from the, rural, uh, the electrification, rural electrification administration, and said, go to Brazil, and we're going to transform Brazil. Uh, we could not do that in the world as a whole because World War II is raging. But we could do it. We could begin to do it in South America. This is not simply a plan. This was done. And these are uh, Roosevelt's words for what we're going to do. We're going to industrialize Brazil. And he's doing this with the Brazilians, uh, cheering and, and full of hope and pride. Cook wrote this book, Brazil on the March. Roosevelt went there in 1943. That's right next to Africa. Brazil is, I go back, a thousand miles closer to the Eastern Hemisphere. So it was a war, it was a war corridor. So he met again with the Brazilian president, it was in, and then on, on Vargas's Right over there is Harry Hopkins. They began the great steel complex in Brazil uh, with railways going to the appropriate cities and supply points. This now still produces what, 5 million tons of steel a year. This is Brazil's steel complex, and we started it. With, it was financed by, partly by Brazil and partly by our Exim Bank. This is from the book by Morris Cook, Pump House and Blast Furnace. And there it is, later shot, very bad photograph. Roosevelt sent Henry Wallace to Asia in 1943. And the, uh, this is the pamphlet that Henry Wallace wrote, and published in 1944, uh, for rapid industrialization of Asia on a vast scale. There is a map in the book. There are two Asias, just like we had the house divided in the United States for Lincoln. Free Asia and subject Asia. The free countries are Russia, China, Thailand, the Philippines, and Australia. And this, the subject countries are India, Burma and the Netherlands, uh, Indies. These are Wallace's words. This is from the book. This is a, this is his 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 words. If if it's not if it looks like it's a it's a quote from the source, you'll you'll see that easily. If it's my words, you'll see it also. Why subject? Because under British control or Japanese control? No, under British. British control. Yeah, okay. under British and French and, French okay. and Dutch. But as you'll see, that, 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 well, so here. Here's uh, Alaska needs to be a much larger population. I can't see it so well here from here. Sorry. Needs, to, needs a much larger population than at present to service the rail, motor, and air routes, which will link America and Asia. We have to master the problems of the far north. And that's his map. This is all from the book published in 44. And as the appendix, the Atlantic Charter, which is Franklin Roosevelt's pledge to displace imperialism. In 1938, the president of Mexico, uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, 
took over Shell Oil and Standard Oil. Those properties were not worth $400 million, like the headline says, but he took them over. And here is the American ambassador, the guy in the middle, Josephus Daniels. The Mexican president is on the left. Here's a photograph, and go back to World War I so you see what's happening here. On the left is Thomas Edison. Right next to him is Josephus Daniels. Over on the right is Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Josephus Daniels was Secretary of the Navy in World War I. He appointed Thomas Edison to head up a, a, an invention board for the Navy. Daniels was Secretary of Navy. His assistant secretary is Franklin Roosevelt. They were, uh, they were in a, an anti-British faction in the Navy, leading that faction of the Wilson administration with Admiral Benson and Fleet Admiral Henry Wilson. As president, Franklin Roosevelt sent his old boss, Josephus Daniels, to Mexico to stand up to the British and Wall Street. Uh, okay. So here is the president of Mexico reading the nationalization order and the American ambassador standing by his side. <laughs> this was a very big deal in Mexico. This was the, this was the heart of their, uh, their sense of, of existence. There was a huge demonstration on the anniversary a year later. And Franklin Roosevelt uh, backed this, the takeover of uh, the foreign oil holdings, and he rejected the inflated claims of Britain's Shell Oil and Wall Street's Standard Oil. You're going to see many newspaper items in this program where the words in the newspaper are not something that that newspaper would have cared to say but they've been put there by the President of the United States. This one and a, and a later one. In, in the book, about, uh, in the book by, written about this whole thing by Ambassador Daniels, he says, it was fortunate for all concerned the U.S. was represented in negotiating with the Mexicans by Morris L. Cook. That's the guy from the Rural Electrification an able, distinguished, and just economist and expert. So he was in the, he was in the negotiations with Mexico on, for FD, on FDR's side. And Daniels also explained about this man in the inset, Patrick Hurley, who was involved to settle this. Uh, Hurley was, had an Irish Republican father. He had to leave Ireland. They moved to Indian Territory where Hurley grew up with the Choctaws and became their national lawyer. He was Secretary of War for Herbert Hoover. He was a Republican. And he got into Sinclair Oil Company. And in the negotiations with Mexico, he went down there and made a deal for Sinclair Oil with the Mexican government. And that was the end of Standard Oil and Shell. That's what happened next, or happened early in the negotiations. They stuck with Franklin Roosevelt. They broke Mexico's relations with England. This is a cartoon, a very affectionate cartoon, in Mexico when Josephus Daniels, the ambassador, left. They loved him. Iran, 1943, December. You see Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill. They, I think they posed for this photograph about three hours, sitting there on the porch with Roosevelt slouching. I mean, with uh, Churchill on the, on, the, on the right there. This is a meeting to formulate the plans to uh, win the war. Invasion of Normandy and uh, Russia 
comes into the war uh, uh, to finish the war in Asia. There's the photographers. Franklin Roosevelt's personal representative, Patrick Hurley, the same one from the Mexico negotiations made the strategic arrangements. He, he got the Russians to put FDR and his staff to live in the Russian embassy during this conference. And it was Patrick Hurley who framed uh, the Iran declaration by the uh, big three powers, a mutual pledge of sovereignty for the nation of Iran. And, and this would be the basis for post-war international cooperation. Then, in Tehran, following the conference, Roosevelt asked Hurley to draft the American plan for transforming Iran itself as our model for developing the world's poor nations. This is the memorandum was drafted by Patrick Hurley. I found it in the National Archives. It's never been published. And this is mentioned in Elliot Roosevelt's book or the fact that he was going to be asked to write something like this. That Hurley would. He says the imperialisms, well, let me, I have to step over here because the light is in the way. If imperialism is dead, it seems very reluctant to lie down. And he mentions, what are the imperialisms? Germany, Japan, Italy, France, Belgium, Portugal, and the Netherlands. Well, those are the imperialisms, right? All sort of alike. Oh, my God, the Nazis and the, and the, ne and the Dutch and the French, that's all alike? Yeah, but then there's the real bad one. The British imperialism seems to have acquired a new life from the blood and productivity and liberty that a free nation is giving it, defended by the blood of soldiers of the most democratic nation. We're approaching the irrepressible conflict between worldwide imperialism and worldwide democracy. Keep in mind, this is the memorandum, more or less dictated by Franklin Roosevelt and then used by him in the administration as our policy for post-war world. He discusses in here the development of transportation, communications, industry, sanitation, education for Iran. What's going to get in the way of this? Uh, imperialism. We are, we are uh, running up against a, an irrepressible uh, conflict between democracy and imperialism. I think that was on the last slide. Russia has earned itself an assured place as a first-class world power. Uh, and he, this man is, a, is really a dedicated anti-communist and a Republican. And also, Iranian officials want America to come in with business to help develop Iran, as well as American experts. I think we better have our government vet and check any businessman from America that goes over there before they get in there. Franklin Roosevelt wrote this cover letter and circulated the Hurley Memorandum within the United States government. Is it possible to... Should I read that? Yes. I'd like you to read the first three paragraphs, would you? Enclosed is a very interesting letter from Pat Hurley. It is in general along the lines of my talk with him. Iran is definitely a very, very backward nation. It consists really of a series of tribes, and 99% of the population is in effect in bondage to the other 1%. The 99% do not own their land and cannot keep their own production or convert it into money or property. I was rather thrilled with the idea of using Iran as an example of what we could do by an unselfish American policy. 
We could not take on a more difficult nation than Iran. I would like, however, to have a try at it. The real difficulty is to get the right kind of American experts who would be loyal to their ideals, not fight among themselves, and be absolutely honest financially. This was then sent to Winston Churchill by President Roosevelt. And uh, I, I don't have time to read it, but it, he's having a lot of fun uh, sending this to Winston. Sent this in, in uh, February 44 with my warm regards. And three months later, Winston Churchill replied <laughs> to that letter. He said, British imperialism has spread and is spreading democracy more widely than any other system of government since the beginning of time. At that time, the British were in active mode for what amounted to the assassination of Franklin Roosevelt. They never killed him, but they, they did everything possible to kill his government, and, and this, the coup against him started in 1943. General seems to have some ideas about British imperialism, which I confess make me rub my eyes. He makes out, for example, that there's an irrepressible conflict between imperialism and democracy. Right. <laughs> After Roosevelt uh, was dead, the Sultan of Morocco, who was also head of the Arab League, said publicly that Franklin Roosevelt had promised to intervene and, and help bring uh, Morocco to freedom from uh, French imperialism. And he said that Churchill, if that Winston Churchill had, uh, had not joined President Roosevelt in the promise, if Churchill had his way, imperialism would continue forever. This didn't belong to England. So keep that in mind that you, when, you, when you're thinking about Nations and their connection to imperialism, it's a, it's a very loose idea. You'll see this especially in Africa. So Roosevelt sponsored Arab nationalism against the British and French empires. Churchill and the British apparatus intervened to substitute Harry Truman for Henry Wallace for, for vice president in the, on the 1944 ticket. But after Franklin Roosevelt's death, Harry Hopkins and others in the administration, in the continuing Truman administration, tried to keep the Franklin Roosevelt policy going under Truman against British pressure and against treason from insiders here. By 1946, the coup was ready for public unveiling by Churchill in person. It's useful to glance at the character of the British Empire team in this coup in London and Washington. This is from the website of the Churchill Center at the Churchill War Rooms in London, and it's written by Churchill's official biographer and posted on Churchill's own website. And it describes his, this is just part of it, his Churchill's uh, leadership of the eugenics movement in England, uh, where he's calling for uh, the uh, sterilization of the unfit he goes on at length about who is unfit. And we're, we're faced with the problem that we're not, that, that uh, the birth of unfit people is unchecked by any of the old restraints of nature and fostered by civilized conditions. That's our real problem. So he called for compulsory sterilization, a simple surgical operation so the inferior could be permitted freely in the world without causing much inconvenience to others. Uh, he spoke about setting up, as home minister of England, he spoke about setting up forced labor camps uh, for mental defectives. This part here is not in the 
on the Churchill website, but it's in all the newspapers. He was vice president of the first uh, International Congress of Eugenics in 1812. 1812. I'm sorry, 1912. He was thinking like 1812. <laughs> this is an article written in 1920 by Winston Churchill, the Right Honorable Sir Winston Churchill, and it's about the worldwide satanic, diabolical Jewish conspiracy to, to enslave the world under communism. He talks about, it starts off, some people like Jews and some do not. This same astounding race uh, may be producing in other systems of morals and philosophy, malevolent, it may shatter irretrievably Christianity, it's the gospel of the Antichrist, and so forth. The schemes of the international Jews, a sinister confederacy, a worldwide conspiracy, he takes it back to the French Revolution. You probably hear that from, from uh, 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 you know, your, your populist contacts half the time. And then it is, it, you know, it's mainly the, the communist revolution of today. And the Jews have been allowed to prey upon the temporary prostration of the German people. This is in 1920. So, uh, three years later, Hitler would use this theme in his coup attempt in uh, 1923. He ends with a deal for the Jews. Where I'm not going to press this on you if you'll back Britain's plan for Zionism. And we need to secure this homeland for the Jewish race, which will be under the protection of the British crown. Over in America, the Harriman family founded the eugenics headquarters for the United States in 1911 to promote the doctrine of the British Home Secretary. Uh, Winston Churchill wrote the, the uh, Mental Defectives Act, which was enacted after, shortly after he left office. And, but this was then promoted by the office set up by the Harriman family. And this is, I think, a very remarkable document here. This is the report published by the eugenics organization in 1932 when they had a meeting, a uh, worldwide meeting with all Nazis there and so forth. And it, it, the whole thing is dedicated to the mother of Averill Harriman. Mrs. E. H. Harriman, founder of the Eugenics Records Office. You go down in the document and it says, Mrs. E. H. Harriman, address, 39 Broadway, deceased. Okay, the dead woman who's paying for this, her address is 39 Broadway. Well, what's 39 Broadway? How come this lady lives at 39 Broadway? What is that? There's 39 Broadway. It's the home of the bank set up for, to finance the Nazi party of Germany uh, for this man, Fritz Thyssen. It was established in 1922 before Hitler's first coup attempt and to help, apparently, to help pay for that. And this is about Herr, uh, Dr. Thyssen, a friend and supporter of Herr Hitler and so forth. The bankers are sending, now that you have a couple of other fellows, the Dulles brothers. They're sending John Foster Dulles to Berlin to meet with the Hitler regime when it first came in. And there is Brown Brothers Harriman and Company. The, the Harriman Bank merged with the English bank Brown Brothers run, uh, under the direction of the head of the Bank of England. And they are sending... John Foster Dulles to meet with Hitler. He was their envoy to Adolf Hitler, and they were his lawyers, both John Foster and Allen. There is Lord Halifax on our left, and to the right is Hermann Goering. And uh, Halifax was the Viceroy of India. 
uh, he's known as Lord Irwin then, before Halifax. He, he arrested Mahatma Gandhi in, in India. In this period, in the 1930s, he was the head of the pro-Hitler faction in politics in Britain and very, very close to the royal family. His wife was lady-in-waiting to the, to the royals. Now we're going to see something here. There it is. Lord Halifax spends the last few days of his tour as the guest of General Goering on the latter's Prussian estates. And though the guest sticks to his bowler, the host wears the sort of hat that would create a diversion in Piccadilly. Britain's envoy has proved himself such an expert on the subject of hunting that the Germans have dubbed him Sir Tally Hofax. And of course, General Goering is his country's master of the hunt, so the two have something in common. But somehow we suspect that what they're hunting for is a political formula. Why don't they ask the bison? Maybe they could tell them something about living in peace. <laughs> so this is 1937. He wasn't even in the government at that point, but he was sent as British representative to meet with the Nazis and tell them, you have a green light for Hitler's conquests. So then Halifax was Neville Chamberlain's foreign minister, and he is the one who personally made the deals to give Europe to Adolf Hitler. This is in Munich. Um, Here is the second from the left is Sumner Wells. I think this is 1940. On the left is the British Foreign Minister, Neville, uh, uh, Lord Halifax. Over here is the, the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain. And to the right is our Ambassador, Joe Kennedy, father of John Kennedy. Uh, and uh, Halifax was Joe Kennedy's main contact with the Nazis. That is, he, that's how he plugged into the Nazis, is through this gang of the upper oligarchy in England. Churchill, as prime minister, made Lord Halifax the arch-Nazi ambassador to the United States for the entire World War II. And he was here to help Churchill bring about the coup against Roosevelt at the end of the war. In 1944, uh, Franklin Roosevelt differed with, publicly with Churchill on the question of continuing fascism in Spain. Roosevelt didn't like it, and Churchill did, and said so publicly. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, when asked about it, basically said that Churchill has been a fascist for 60 years. And that's the long and the short of it. Okay, so following FDR's death, I'm picking out two people as, as crucial in this that are, that are very publicly identifiable. Obviously, there are other people be, uh, not so much in that way, but these are up front, Atchison and Harriman. The first crisis of the Cold War, so-called, uh, was over Iran in late 1945. And there were Senate hearings, and there's General Hurley from the 1880s Indian Territory and the Iran guy blasting Atchison, Dean Atchison, who's in the State Department, for destroying President Roosevelt's policy for Iran. Dean Atchison's father was a Northern Ireland Belfast man. His mother was British. And in his family in Massachusetts, uh, they celebrated all the royal family's holidays. And he was more pro-British Empire than any Englishman. I think that that's kind of standard for probably people in that kind of condition. Uh-oh. Let's go back. Sorry. So Hurley deeply embarrassed him by revealing that he had sabotaged 
And, and the Hurley Memorandum had circulated with Roosevelt's cover letter, and it was denounced back during the war by Atchison. And he, on his denunciation, he said that this was hysterical, uh, messianic globaloni. He was a minor State Department person at the time. There it is. Nevertheless, uh, here is um, our state, our, our Secretary of State, under the first one under Truman, Jimmy Burns on the right, and the Russian and British foreign ministers at a meeting in Moscow. And this is, a, I think, a, the, the, the turning point, you could say, of this whole situation. Uh, Burns is trying to continue with some aspects of Franklin Roosevelt's policy in the world. And our ambassador to Russia, Averill Harriman, met with the British representatives privately and told them, our Secretary of State does not represent this, the, our policy now. Disregard him, he's a fool. And he spread rumors and gossip against him. And there's a quote from uh, how he was undermined uh, by, by Harriman, who then was working on Truman, as, as were other people. Oh, I want to mention that, of course, Harriman went to the Churchill household in 1940. And had a sexual affair with the Churchill's son's wife while the son, Randolph, was off fighting in the army. He later married this woman. Her name was Pamela Churchill. That's Pamela Harriman. So he has a very strange relationship, a bond with Churchill. <laughs> So here is the article about Churchill coming to, after he met with Truman in the White House, he went down to Florida and met with Jimmy Burns down there and laid down the law. And Burns was morally crippled at that point and, and completely surrendered. And it says here that they will announce the terms of the surrender, basically, in the speech coming up in Fulton, Missouri, by Churchill, who says we're merging the, Amer the American government and the British Empire to fight communism. Harriman was going to be Secretary of Commerce, Strategy Coordinator for NATO, and uh, the U.S. is swallowed into the British Empire. Only one small thing? Yeah. From Goebbels, yes, that's right. It was a Nazi phrase. Uh, but then, how did the Nazis get it? Yeah. Do a little deeper, you're going to get, probably get back to Churchill or what have you. You're, but that's right, exactly right. This is all completely discredited at the time, but people were scared. Why were they scared? Well, Lawrence Duggan, who was the director of the good neighbor policy, was murdered in 1948, thrown out a window, an obvious murder. They didn't try to cover it up. It was just totally obvious. And then within hours, they called him a communist. And if you go into the so-called internet, you know, Wikipedia, that's the, that's the line about him. The most incredibly stupid slander. This, this guy is a super patriot. And, and also a, a direct representative of Franklin Roosevelt. This is from the book by Dean Acheson. When he became Secretary of State for Truman, uh, I made the offer, an orthodox proposal to the British Ambassador Sir Oliver Franks. We're going to talk regularly uh, in secret, and we'll go to his residence or mine, and no one was going to be informed about this. He was made a, a, a member, a, a, a virtually, essentially a member of the cabinet the British ambassador. At that time, Kim Philby was the first secretary of the British embassy. Very confusing, right? 
It's good. It's good to be confused about these things. Here is Dean Acheson in London. There's the British Prime Minister Attlee laughing. Here is the Republican John Foster Dulles, appointed by the Democratic President Truman as advisor to Secretary of State Dean Acheson. Dulles went immediately to Korea, to the Korean border. It was quiet on the Korean border, tense but quiet. And while he was there, there he, there's Dulles and Acheson, Republican and Democrat, the party system. While he was there, the Korean War started. There is the British ambassador, Franks, Truman, and Acheson. In 1951, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran uh, came up to take over the oil, British oil monopoly, known, known uh, later as British Petroleum Company, BP. And he came into office to do that. He became prime minister. Keep in mind, in this Iran overthrow of Mossadegh, this is 51, go back as the people at that time did to 1938, 13 years earlier, when the Mexicans, with America's backing, took over these fraudulent claims of the, of the international oil companies, and, and they broke with the British. New York Times lies that this is a problem of communism, and no person ever said or believed that he was a communist. Nobody said that, but they imply it. Truman appointed Alan Dulles, head of covert operations in the Central Intelligence Agency. Dulles and his second, Frank Wisner, were both protégés, not protégés, but close to and, and completely associated with Atchison. And uh, Dulles's, uh, th th he had learned from his uncle's friend, his uncle was Lansing in World War I, the Secretary of State who betrayed us to the British. And they had a friend named Captain Gaunt from British Intelligence, and he was the model for Alan Dulles, who, who thought he was the most exciting person, Captain Gaunt. This is the Truman Policy Memo just before they left office, officially setting up the, the uh, interagency uh, and uh, also U.S.-British official cooperation for uh, overthrowing the government of Iran. And then here is the memo right after Eisenhower comes in, or uh, the, actually Alan Dulles as, as, uh, as CIA director and John Foster as Secretary of State, they said, okay, we've been planning this, now we're ready to go with a coup. Mossadegh was overthrown by the CIA and British intelligence, a disgrace for the United States. <laughs>